as a person of faith, we pray for strength, but we can't get strength unless we go through difficult things. Right. So these are the types of things that I have been blessed to experience in order to help mature me into the man that I hope that my parents are proud of today. When born with half a heart, what are your chances of having a professional career in music? When health problems escalate to the point of needing a heart transplant, does that mean your professional career is over? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski. I'm a heart mom and the host of your program. Many of you know that I have a son named Alexander who was born with basically half a heart. He was diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and it is because of Alex that I am the host of your program. Today's show is Broken Miracle, and our guest is Paul Cardle. Paul Cardle was born in 1973 with only half a heart. He had his first surgery a few hours after birth and two more surgeries at 13 and 14 years of age. As a child, he took piano lessons but wasn't keen on practice. As a teenager, he started composing and became obsessed. He was hired to play at weddings in restaurants and department stores. In 1994, author Richard Paul Evans invited him to compose a musical adaptation of his number one New York Times bestselling novel, The Christmas Box, which helped launch Paul's professional career. In 1999, Paul founded Stone Angel Music, where he released his albums independently. His albums debuted at number one on eight Billboard charts and have earned over two billion streams on Pandora alone. By 2008, Paul's health had declined to the point where he was placed on the transplant list. Following his transplant in 2009, Paul experienced a newfound energy. Today, he lives a very full and active life as an entrepreneur, recording artist, husband, and father. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Paul. It's nice to be with you. It is so nice to actually talk to you because I've listened to you in my car for years. Well, I appreciate that. You've got good good taste. (laughs) I should say so. I love your music. It's very soothing. And when I have long car rides, which I frequently do since I live in Texas, your music is the perfect backdrop to get me where I need to go safely. Thank you so much. So I've known about you, it seems like forever, but I didn't know until... I don't know, I guess it was fairly recently that you were a single ventricle patient. Can you tell us a little bit more about your heart condition and some of your surgeries? Sure. I came into the world in 1973 with a single functioning ventricle. They diagnosed it as double inlet left ventricle, and I had transposition of the greater vessels. I also had a large aseptal defect and pulmonary stenosis. So within 22 hours of being alive, they went in and operated on me and did what was called the POTS shunt. And even though that was done away with in 1969, that is what the surgeon knew in Salt Lake City, where I had my first surgery at Primary Children's Hospital. And he did that Hot shunt, and I was fine. Of course, they told my parents I wouldn't live very long. There was not enough information about congenital heart disease. And though my cardiologist had worked with Helen Tossig at John Hopkins and knew of her and Dr. Blaylock and others, there wasn't a lot in 1973 for kids like me, and most of us were not surviving. But fortunately, that POTS preserved my life until they could come up with another solution. And that solution was a mystery at the time. I was taken home and not expected to live through the year. My mother already had three daughters, so I had three older sisters. And I was not able to do much as a, as a child. I would go out and play, but I got tired and would have to come in. But my mother never sheltered me. She didn't say, well, you need to come in and hang out and I'm going to watch over you like a hawk. She didn't know enough about congenital heart disease and there was not the internet. So she couldn't Google and speculate. She had to trust the system in place. Fortunately, our cardiologist was very wise, well-connected, and reviewed what the cutting-edge technology was. And 
I told my parents that eventually I'd need a, another procedure in order to save my life or the heart would outgrow or become too physically strong to where I couldn't have any procedures and I, I would not survive. But I kept living. I became a Boy Scout. I got my eagle. I participated in a lot of outdoor activities. I wasn't able to do many of the hiking. I wasn't able to play soccer. I wasn't able to play basketball. There was a lot of things I was not able to do. Mm -hmm. My lips were somewhat bluish. And then at age 13, I got endocarditis. Yeah. And they could not figure out where the source of the infection was at the time. Fortunately, in 1986, there was a brand new device, an x-ray that could scan the entire human body called an MRI. Mm -hmm. And Salt Lake City had just gotten their first MRI. And I was sent down to have my body scanned and they couldn't find the source of the infection. I went back a second time. They couldn't find a source of the infection. By that time, my family was invited up. My All my brothers and sisters, the eight children that my mother had given birth to, and there was pretty much a goodbye. They didn't think I'd survive at all. And then they decided to do one more MRI. And we went down in the ambulance to do the MRI to the adult hospital. And they discovered the source of the infection. It was a walnut-sized blister on the pots. That I oh, my goodness. Pot. It had developed to the point where it could burst any moment. Mm -hmm. It's amazing I didn't die. And the idea was, how do we go in and cut that out and remove it completely? And then how do we reroute the blood? And what they did was take the pots down, and then they added a, another kind of pots or a Norwood to the right side of it. Mm -hmm. Then they said, because there's a new procedure called the Fontan, and this is one of the earlier stages of the Fontan. It's not the really well done Fontan that's today, that, that is available today. It's basically something we were told about. We were not excited about, but I had to come back a year later for the reconstructive Fontan procedure. It was a miracle I survived that endocarditis and I went off to school. And for me, mentally, as somebody with congenital heart disease who had been told by my parents, that this was all for a reason. I felt like I needed to know my purpose and I did not know what that was, but I believed my purpose was to survive congenital heart disease and be an example to others. At least that was the motivation that I put in my mind. And so in junior high school, I ran for a student body officer in an election and I won. The whole reason of doing that was I needed something to live for. There was something I needed to do. So as a believer in a higher power, I felt like, well, there you go. Now I have a purpose and you can't take me. So that's kind of the strange childhood that I grew up in, but it was beautiful because it redirected my thoughts to where I was determined, like Rocky, to go in and win the fight. <laughs> Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
before the break, Paul, we were learning about your congenital heart defect, and I've actually done some research on you and was doing some reading about you online, but I never knew what your heart defect was. So to learn that it was double inlet left ventricle and that you had TGA and an ASD, your heart defect was actually very similar to my son's. And I understand the concern with the Fontan. So you kind of left us hanging right before the break. And I know that you had a revised shunt put in and you're saying that it was probably like a Norwood after the POTS takedown. Did you end up with a Fontan heart? I did, but it was complicated because the surgeon performed the Fontan and then there were complications. Mm. They needed to go back in and they ended up putting in a pacemaker, which Mm. I was not happy about. Sure. Many of my friends were like, it's okay. My grandparents have those. (laughs) That's not what you want to hear as a teenager. No, but the pacemaker failed (gasps) and they had to take me back in again. So that would have been the fourth time my middle section, my sternum would be cut open and those staples are fresh. Mm. So going down the hall, I told my father, I'm tired of this. I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. And he kind of scolded me. You go in there, you do the surgery, and you come out and live. Wow. Looking back, I'm very grateful because he had tremendous strength Mm -hmm. to tell me what I needed to do, and I did it. And the procedure was beautiful. I ended up with a very healthy pacemaker, and I collected those over the years because you have to replace those. I thought, you know, maybe by the time I'm 60, I can decorate a Christmas tree with pacemaker. (laughs) Something to look forward to. Oh my goodness, you're the first person who has told me that you collect your pacemakers. Wow, Paul. Souvenirs of of a life well lived, you know? Absolutely. So it was a beautiful, ironic experience. It's a bittersweet experience. You, as a person of faith, we pray for strength, but we can't get strength unless we go through difficult things. Right. So these are the types of things that I have been blessed to experience in order to help mature me into the man that I hope that my parents are proud of today. Oh, I'm sure they are. And it seems to me from what I've read about you, Paul, that in addition to becoming stronger emotionally, spiritually, you found your passion. Talk to us about how you found your passion for music. As a junior in high school, One of my best friends who played the piano was killed in a car accident. I was devastated. I couldn't understand why somebody so healthy Mm. one day could have this accident and pass away. And me, my parents spending a fortune on medical bills, shots, needles, surgery after surgery. Here I am, a mess. I went into my parents' living room where the piano was that I hadn't touched since I was eight years old. And I began to play a couple notes. And the notes was a melody, and I felt this overwhelming joy and comfort and peace. And I began looking at the piano like it was a puzzle, like life is a puzzle. And I want to put the pieces together. And I found there were patterns as I was playing. I created my first song. And I just began playing the piano three hours every day just because it was helping me process all my trauma. Yeah. Yeah with music and music began to heal my heart Mm. and it evolved into a career where the whole purpose of it is to heal your heart. I just absolutely love that. Like I was telling you, I have your music in my car and I listen to you and it is very healing. It's very soothing. So I think you, at least with me, you've accomplished your mission, but also for it to have accomplished that mission with you, that is just so lovely. It's a blessing. There are things that come into our lives to help us get through the trauma. And I was fortunate to have music as a gift. The the irony in all that though, is when I was a teenager, the big worry was insurance. How do you get insurance? Because Mm -hmm. nobody with pre-existing conditions could get insurance. So being a musician, that was another fear you have to face. But fortunately, pre-existing conditions are not a problem anymore. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Well, 
when I was doing research on you, Paul, I saw that you have been doing so much good in the congenital heart defect or CHD community. You've established a scholarship fund for CHD students. And that is so important because not all of our students can go to school full time. And I don't know if your scholarship fund is also available for students who can only go part time, but that is something that I have thought about doing is starting a scholarship fund for students who need to just go part time. You've helped through uh, funding CHD research with Saving Tiny Hearts and Project Heart. I'm so impressed with all the philanthropy that you've done. What keeps you motivated to keep working with these organizations? Well, obviously, joy comes from service. And helping these other patients is the greatest joy of my life. These kids, you look at their faces, and you want them to have the same blessings that you have. You know, I've been able to fall in love, go to college, have children, get married, do all these things. I want this for these kids. And so many people deny themselves an education because there's so much in the medical bills, Mm. stress, the, I don't think I'm going to live very long, Yeah, but you should live right now and not worry about tomorrow. And, but that, of course, when you're born with a complex heart defect, you always worry about not retirement, but what's next. Oh, Paul, you are the first person to say that. And that is so true. It can be very scary because you're told you won't go to college. You're not going to be able to do this or that. You're probably not going to live very long. So you become obsessed with God and with what does it all mean? What is this all about? So when I discovered music, everything came together with there is purpose in why we're here, why Mm -hmm. we're suffering, why we're having these experiences. And it's basically so that we can become one with each other and love each other, help each other. We're kids in a sandbox learning to get along. Oh, I just love that. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Paul, in 2009, you received a heart transplant. Can you tell us about the conditions that led to you needing the transplant? Yes. The long-term side effects of the early Fontan that I received is protein losing enteropathy. My body was not breaking down protein. Mm. I needed to eat like a steak almost every day and get as many protein shakes as possible, but it was still not processing. And my liver was working overtime to try to help that heart. But as the heart that was only half there works, it gets bigger and bigger. So it was collapsing my right lung. Mm. I began a regimen of taking milrinone, which was to slow the process so that they could put me on a heart transplant list and basically be alive long enough to receive it because I had right. o positive blood, which mm. is the most popular blood. Most people on the transplant list I have O positive. So it was going to take quite a bit of time for me to receive a heart, but I ultimately was just, my heart was failing. Mm. I was on oxygen full time. Mm. They give you a 
beautiful handicap parking pass, which is great for Costco. Other than that, <laughs> it, it wasn't that fun. So I was in major heart failure at age 36. Oh, wow. 22 years after the Fontan. Wow. That's just amazing. First of all, it's amazing that you did as well as you did for as long as you did, because you're right. Those early Fontans, first of all, they were not as successful as Fontans are today. For those of you who don't know, after some time, they started doing fenestrated Fontans, which is the kind of Fontan my son had. And the whole reason they did it was because of PLE, because sure. protein losing enteropathy is such a serious possible consequence, and that can kill you. So you had the Fontan before they were even doing that. And the fact that you lasted for over 20 years with that Fontan heart, that's pretty miraculous. Yeah. And if there are any listeners who are dealing with the protein losing enteropathy, ask your doctor about milrinone. It is a beautiful thing that slowed the process. So you still have a, a clock ticking, but it slows the process to get the doctors thinking clearly about what they need to do next. And there are options, which there weren't a whole lot of options before, but definitely heart transplant is an option. And for so many people who have PLE, when they have a heart transplant, their PLE goes away. Not everyone, but for so many, that is the case. Was that the case for you? Not only did it go away, it cured my liver. Wow. And it restored my lungs. And I used to feel like I was driving a beat up old truck. And then they gave me the keys to a Porsche. <laughs> so I highly recommend transplants. The other option was this Fontaine revision, but the gentlemen that had preserved my life that had not been on the cutting edge at the time because they were so focused on the success they were having, they didn't know any better. Meanwhile, a female came in, Angela Yetman, a brilliant mind. She knew the cutting edge technology and she explained it much clearer that's why we didn't do the revision and we went straight to transplant. Well, I think that made so much sense because from what I understand, even having a Fontan revision, the PLE wouldn't have gone away. No. Your, your heart might have done better, but the PLE may not have improved. And so you still right. might have had problems. So going the transplant route seems obviously to have done beautifully for you. You're now almost 12 years mm -hmm. post-transplant and you're still with the same heart. Yes. And they have told me that uh, I'm in the clear. The heart will probably remain forever. It's the other organs we need to monitor and look after. And I'm very faithful in taking my medication because as a congenital patient, we learn how to take medications. So we do <laughs> true. Very, very well as transplant patients. And I have less medication now than I ever have before. Really? You have less medication now as a transplant patient than you did when you just had a pacemaker? All I have now is the immunosuppressants, two pills. That's wow. It. I'm very fortunate. I don't know you what are. I did to deserve it, but uh, <laughs> my mother, God loves my mother, I, I guess. Wow. That is such an inspiring story, Paul, because I know that's one of the things that's very scary to people is when you first come home from transplant, you had quite a bag full of medications to take, didn't you? You didn't only have two when you first came home from transplant. Well, the first two weeks, they fill you with steroids. And I didn't need steroids very long. And they just put me on these two pills because that's what they felt my body required. Now, that's not the same for everybody because there's a custom right. Right. formula. Because when you get into transplants, now you're in chemistry. Sure. Before that, it's all physiology. So Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So really, even post-transplant, it doesn't sound like you had a huge regimen of pills. I've known friends whose children have had transplants, and they have quite a regimen of medications to take morning, noon, and night. So it sounds like it wasn't quite as arduous for you. The arduous problem was the ongoing biopsies, mm. where you are having so many biopsies week after week until it goes month to month, then year to year. But that's one thing that was probably the biggest hassle. You survive, mm -hmm. but you still have to maintain. You know, you have to go get your oil change. You have to get your emissions test. This is what we have to do with our bodies. And as long as you stay on top of it, you're going to be fine. Eat healthy. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the sugar. Be wise. And that's how we're going to be proactive and survive longer. 
Right. Absolutely. Well, I saw that you've actually released a new album and a biography by the same name, which I also use for this podcast, (laughs) The Broken Miracle. I love the name of it. Tell us about how you became an author and tell us about your album. So The Broken Miracle, basically, it's actually written by J.D. Meadow, and it's based on my life. So it's a fiction oh, okay. story based on my life. It's in two parts. Part one is out. Part two is coming out. But I've had so many wonderful people email me over the years with questions. And I got to the point where I was spending so much time doing that because I answer almost everybody. How can I answer everybody at once so that they are also inspired? Mm-hmm. So we wrote The Broken Miracle which tells my story, but it also gets into my personal life, the music, the marriage. And what's interesting for parents that they will notice and observe in there, the side effects of what happens to somebody with congenital heart disease in the long run. How does the marriage work? How does college work? How do they get a job? What do they do? So the broken miracle answers so many of those questions. And then we did a soundtrack for the book and we've got incredible artists, even though I'm a pianist. I wrote some vocal songs, Mm -hmm. artists like David Archuleta, Tyler Glenn from Neon Trees, Thompson Square. We've got some incredible artists on there singing what I wish I could sing. I never got a good voice, but I can make music. And so that album is there to motivate, inspire, and encourage not just congenital heart patients, but anyone who's ever suffered or dealt with trauma, PTSD, depression, miscarriages, all kinds of things that have been rampant in my life. But now I'm at a point where it's just absolutely, I'm just in awe looking back of what's happened and what's, I pinch myself. I can't even believe I'm still here, but I'm very fortunate. So that's what it is. The broken miracle. Wow. It sounds amazing. So the music is not just piano, like what some of your other albums are, but you actually invited other artists to take part in it as well. And it sounds to me like that's what your entire life has been about, Paul. It's been about involving a village of people that you have surrounded yourself with and who have helped you to be the man you are today. I'm a firm believer that you got to surround yourself with people much wiser, smarter, and better than yourself. And, you know, I'm so fortunate to have worked with these musicians like Thompson Square sings this song that I wrote called The Man with Half a Heart. Can you love a man with half a heart? And all of the stuff that comes with that. And that's a question that I pose, not just for my wife, but for my children, for my family. With all that we go through, can you still hang in there? Because we want to hang in there. Can you help us? I love that. So it's not autobiographical. You didn't write it yourself, but it sounds like you inspired an artist to write your book. Is that correct? That's right. J.D. Neto is a popular fantasy writer, born in Brazil, but lives in New York City. And uh, he's been a fan of the music and he wanted to tell my story. He thought it was like a fantasy novel because (laughs) anytime you get raised from the dead, he says, I've got to write about that. So, Oh, yes. I heard you on the podcast, Everyday Miracles with my friend, Julie Hindenburg, and you talked there about some of the miracles that you experienced. We don't have time to get into that today, but friends, go listen to episode number 71 of Julie's Everyday Miracles. You will get another hour with Paul, and it will be well worth the time that you spend listening because he is able to go into much greater depth about what happened in his near-death experience. Experience. And I just found that episode fascinating. So I'm so happy Julie brought us together, Paul. And I'm so excited to find out about your book. Tell us where we can find your book. You can go to thebrokenmiracle.com. And it's also on Amazon. If you Google my name, it'll have links to pretty much everything. So you, you should be able to find it. Okay. And for those of you who are exercising or driving, please do not Stop what you're doing. Keep what you're doing. All of this will be in the show notes. It'll be clickable, so it'll be so much easier for you. But thebrokenmiracle.com, that's super easy to remember since that's the title of this episode, the book, and the album. Where can people find your album? Ask Alexa or Siri. They've been working for me for about five years. (laughs) Ask Alexa to play Paul Cardall, The Broken Miracle. 
It's on iTunes, Amazon, wherever you like to get your music. And Pandora. That's where I listen to you a lot is on Pandora because <laughs> I love Pandora. Pandora is so wonderful. They've been so good to me. Well, this has been fascinating, Paul. I feel like there's so much more that I want to ask you, but our time is almost up. I do want to mention also that you have a podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about your podcast? For years, I've wanted to interview people to get to the bottom of what they are doing with the gift they've been given. Do they know they have a gift? And so it's called All Heart with Paul Cardall. And we've interviewed all kinds of celebrities and influencers. We try to get to the emotional side of their life rather than focus on their glory. Mm -hmm. And really just the heart of who they are and what they hope to leave in this world. And so you can listen to that where you get your podcasts. So All Heart with Paul Cardall. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Paul. It's been delightful getting to know you. It's an honor to be on here. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody listening. I appreciate you. It's been so much fun. But that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today, my friends. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon or anytime since it's a podcast and I'm available wherever you listen to your podcast. But on Tuesdays, we have new episodes that come out. And until then, you can visit us on our website, heartsunitetheglobe.org. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. <laughs>